In this video, I'm going to kind of cover context point number five. So it's these five videos and then these five slope stop points. What I'll do in a second is I'll cover each stop point and talk about the verbs, which are underlined, and how they relate to content. So basically letting you know what you need to know in terms of each stop point. And you can jump to any dot point by pressing any, any of these links. And I'll jump to the actual part of this video that covers that dot point. Right, so the first dot point was identify the components of the immune response, including the antibodies, T cells, and B cells. Identify the components means you need to name or recognize the components. And the immune response, get, remember that was the third line defense, and that was a specific type of immune response. That means every antigen in, in the body that has, goes into the body has its own specialized lymphocytes that are there designed to fight them, right? So every single antigen has its own lymphocyte. That's what that means. In this case, when it comes to the B lymphocytes and the T lymphocytes, those are the ones you need to know about because they both cover a part of the actual immune response. The T lymphocytes do the cell mediated immune response, whereas B lymphocytes do the humoral immune response. Cell mediated means they destroy pathogens inside cells or they destroy cells. So the T cytotoxic T cell, you can see here, it's inject injecting a chemical into an actual cell and thereby killing it. So T cells are responsible for killing or destroying cells. Whereas B lymphocytes, they're responsible for producing antibodies, and these antibodies then deactivate any, any pathogen inside fluids, so either inside extracellular fluid between the tissue or inside plasma. Right? So these B cells, what they do, the humoral means fluid, so that they actually do immune response which deals with anything in fluid. They, the unactivated form here can differentiate into two different types, plasma cell or the, the memory cell, we'll talk about them more in a second. But the plasma cell, once it's activated, will produce antibodies. And these antibodies will swim from the lymph node because the plasma cells stay in the lymph node. They swim from the lymph node into the plasma or the fluid, and thereby hooking on to any pathogen it can find, any antigen it can find. And when it does so, it will deactivate these antigens, these pathogens that contain these antigens, and allow the macrophages and phagocytes to destroy them as well. Right? So we've got two different types of lymph, uh, actual immune responses, and they're both important to um, and then both make up the third line defense. In terms of the next dot points, let's describe and explain the immune response in terms of the interaction between B and T cells, the mechanisms that allow these interactions between B and T cells, and the range of T lymphocytes and the difference in their roles. So describe means we need to provide features, we need to provide features and characteristics of the immune response, and explain the immune response basically means we need to show how uh, the immune response enables all of these above here. So the first part we'll talk about is the range of T lymphocytes. We said that T lymphocytes help to destroy infected cells. So we need to have one T cell that destroys these cells. That's a cytotoxic T cell, for example. It will destroy the infected cells or cancer cells or transplanted cells. Then we have a T memory cell. This cell will stay in our body after the infection is over and thereby help us give immunity for at least a couple of weeks, if not for a lifelong time. So whenever the actual antigen comes back, it will be quickly destroyed. The T suppressor cell, what it does, it makes sure once the actual infection is over, that all of these T cells go back down, ex except the memory cells, all the other ones get deactivated again, because we don't need to have them unless we are fighting that infection. And the T helper cells are important because what a T helper cell does, once, it, once the T helper cell is actually activated, it will produce something called cytokines. An example of that would be interleukins. And what these cytokines do, is they will activate your macrophages, your T and your B cells. So basically when a T helper cell is activated, it will activate lots more white blood cells to make sure we can have more white blood cells there to fight infection, right? So that was the first part, the role or in the range of T lymphocytes. The other part was we need to talk about the types of interactions and the mechanisms that allow these interactions to occur. All right, so if, for example, we've got a virus or a pathogen inside blood and we have a macrophage which detected that pathogen what it will do, it will do phagocytosis, which means it will hook onto it, then it will consume it, it will eat it, but importantly, it will actually also grab its antigen. So that's the part here. We'll grab that and put it onto a special type of molecule. As you can see, this whole thing here is the MHC2 complex that has an antigen attached to it. So the green thing was the actual molecule, and it's called the MHC2 molecule. So once it's done that, once it's eaten the actual pathogen and, and attached the molecule onto its MHC2 molecule, it will travel all the way to the actual nymph, nymph node and it will come in contact with a T helper cell. And this is the important part because a T helper cell will only get activated by one of those MHC2 and antigen complexes, right? So you can see here, it has a receptor that hooks onto that molecule. And once 
that happens, the T up cell isn't activated, which means it starts releasing these cytokines I mentioned earlier. And these cytokines then swim to through the fluids to other parts of the lymph nodes and thereby activate, for example, B cells, T cells, and macrophages. And these activated macrophages and T cells and B cells, they will proliferate, which means they will duplicate and that allows us to have lots of them. And that means the infection is over quicker because we have lots of white blood cells fighting the infection. And so we need to t talk about the types of the interactions between B and T cells. A macrophage, I use the example of macrophage, but it can also be a B cell as well. So B cell can do the same thing. So B cell can actually activate the T helper cell. So that was the type of interaction. Number one here is the MHC2 molecule on a B cell allows the activation of the T cell, T helper cell. So the activation is a type of interaction. So the B cell activates T helper cell, that's a type of interaction. And what allows that to happen is that MHC2 molecule that is on top of its surface that allows the antigen to stick onto it and thereby activate the actual T helper cell. Right? That was the first type of interaction and the mechanism allows that interaction. And the other one was once the actual T helper cell is activated, what it will re release is it will release these cytokines and these cytokines activate more B and T and macrophages, right? So the type of interaction between B cells and T cells here is that a T cell, a T helper cell, can release cytokines which will activate more B cells. So that's how you have these interactions and the mechanism that allows that to happen is obviously these cytokines which are released. So that was that part here, these two dot points, these parts to the dot point. Next one is outline the ways in which vaccines prevent infection. Outline means uh, sketch in general terms the way and here this graph is important. This graph has antibody concentration on one side and time on the other side. And antibody concentration, remember antibodies are produced by plasma cells, which are activated B cells. So basically the more antibodies we have in our body, that means the more our B cells are active, that means the more our immune response is active. And the time when they start becoming active is after they're exposed to the antigen. So exposure to the antigen starts the primary immune response. And the primary immune response is just when we have, for example, a macrophage that then eats a actual pathogen, sticks this antigen on the molecule, activates a T helper cell, and a T helper cell will activate all the other B cells and T cells, right? That's the primary immune response, but you can see it takes some time for that to happen. And the amount of um, activation is, is less so than with the secondary immune response. It gets there are more antibodies secreted, there's more plasma cells. And that's the reason why is because after that first immune response, we have these memory cells that are, being, that are produced. So now the memory cells will be in our body. And once we have a re-exposure, so when the second exposure comes, when the, when the actual antigen comes back into our body, what happens now is these memory cells will detect the actual antigen and basically really quickly make many more plasma cells. So let's skip, let's skip quite a few steps here, which means the secondary immune response is a lot faster, and that's due to these memory cells. And then so the start of secondary immune response more or less we're, means we're immune. It means we won't get sick again because the infection is dead before it can cause any problems. Right? And so how do the vaccines work and how do va our vaccines relate to this? Basically what vaccines are is just that a weakened or dead part of a pathogen. And they're specifically the part that we focus on is just the actual antigen itself. So the pathogen has this antigen, but we don't really need this pathogen to be able to start the first primary immune response. That's what we're trying to activate. We're trying to expose our body to antigen. But we're doing so for a weakened or dead pathogen as opposed to a live one, which means we still start a prime immune response. We still produce these memory cells, which gives us the whole immunity, but we don't get infected. Right? So it artificially starts the immune response, the primary immune response, without getting any infections. And that's what this whole idea about vaccinations is all about. So we inject dead or, or weakened uh, actual pathogens with the antigens on them that will start that immune response. And then we have immunity. Uh, the next one was evaluate the effectiveness of the vaccination programs in preventing the spread and occurrence of once common diseases, including smallpox, bacteria, and polio. It also says process and analyze and present information, which just means we need to make sure the information we're looking at is valid. And also we need to be able to link that information to the content we need to cover. And the content is evaluate the effectiveness, which means we need to make a judgment on the effectiveness based on criteria of vaccination programs in preventing the spread of one's common diseases, uh, so which means we need to make our own judgment and we need to base that on certain criteria. So for example, polio was a really common disease viral infection, which was a global epidemic, which means it was a huge problem between 1850 and 1950. But nowadays it's almost wiped out in some countries, it doesn't exist anymore in quite a few countries post 1960s, because that's when we started these mass vac vaccination programs, especially by the World Health Organization, which is why those numbers here, you can see the graphs here, 
after these vaccinations, the numbers dropped significantly. And the only countries that still have some case of polio are either um, your developed countries, um, so in your developing countries, or in your developed countries, such as Australia, America. It's the people who have not vaccinated. So that's again another evidence for that these vaccines are actually quite effective. Only people who have no vaccinations are the ones who are still getting polio. The ones who have vaccinations don't get it. These are all the criteria you can use to show how effective it is. Also, diphtheria. Uh, diphtheria is a bacterial infection, and this was well, a common cause of death in children before 1940. But again, cases fell dramatically after the World Health Organization started their vaccination campaigns in the 1960s. Um, and it still affects some countries, but those countries are the countries with lower immunization rates, which means low, not, not, not too many people get vaccines, or not enough people get vaccines. So again, it shows you that after the actual vaccination campaign started, there was a huge drop. The only countries that are affected by it are countries that haven't gotten as many vaccines as other countries. That's, again, a criteria you can be used to show how effective it is. And then we've got smallpox. Smallpox used to be a really problematic viral infection. It was one of the most deadly diseases basically known to man before 1967 because in 1967, the World Health Organization also started again one of those mass vaccination campaigns around the world. And that basically eradicated the whole disease by 1977. So one of the most deadly diseases known to mankind is now gone, completely gone, due to these actual vaccination campaigns, right? So all of this is just information you can use to should make, evaluate the effectiveness, so you'd say, yep, it's very effective, and then you would give some reasons why, you base this on criteria in terms of lower cases and people not vaccinated getting, still getting the disease, and then you make a judgment. And the next, last one is outline the reasons for the suppression of the immune response in organ transplant patients. Outline the reasons means we need to sketch in general terms the reasons, and remember I said that, for example, transplanted cells get attacked by our own body because they have antigens on them, they get recognized by our immune response, our immune system, and specifically by the T cells. So in this case, the cytotoxic T cells are the ones that will destroy the transplant tissue. And these cytotoxic T cells get activated by the cytokines released by T helper cells. So to avoid this from happening, to avoid the destruction of transplanted cells and organs, we try to avoid tissue rejection because this tissue rejection means that we have these T cells that have destroyed the transplant tissue. And we do so by giving people drugs such as cyclosporin, and that suppresses the immune response, which means it weakens that immune response, but specifically the cell-mediated immune response. So not all of them, but just the cell-mediated, so the T lymphocyte immune response. That problem is that people are more susceptible to infection because their one of their immune responses isn't working anymore. But the good thing, it only deactivates that cell-mediated immune response, which means our non-specific ones and our B lymphocytes are still active. Right? But overall, it has to be done to make sure that the actual organs are still working and the person doesn't die from a failed organ. Right, so that was basically a quick summary of all the dot points. But hopefully that was useful.